it's my pleasure to uh, introduce then Hanneke van der Schoor, also a PhD on the uh, project Models of Textual Communities in Leuven then. Hanneke studied first in Leiden, uh, where she uh, graduated on uh, indigenous languages in South America. So she's a linguist by training, but she also did Hebrew linguistics. And uh, then she came and studied with Eibert in uh, Leuven. And Hanneke, we are very much looking forward to your paper uh, on assessing paleographic variation in informal manuscripts, the scribe or scribes of the Testament of Kachat and visions of Amram E. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. You should be able to see my screen now. Not. Okay. So, um, as I would already said in the beginning, um, the focus of my research is on the uh, testament of, of uh, Kahat. And um, this has been uh, considered from the, the, the idea of the, of the project is, as we said, the, the analysis of the um, models of textual communities. And the testament of Kahat in particular is the, the first and most important way in which it has been considered is as part of three other texts forming a kind of trilogy, um, namely the text of um, Levi, Kahat and Amram considered to be a kind of um, group of texts which deal with the priestly patriarchs, kind of predecessing the um, priestly office, which uh, according to the Hebrew Bible starts with uh, Aaron, and here it would have started with uh, Levi. And as part of that, I have paid attention to the manuscript evidence of uh, both of these three uh, compositions. And today I will focus mostly on one copy of the Testament of Kahat and one copy of the uh, Visions of Amram, um, which is the number of 4Q547. The question that I want to assess, um, want to reflect on is how do we assess variation in handwriting in a meaningful way, in a kind of balance between acknowledging the possibility of a large variability within the handwriting of a scribe and a careful analysis of the features uh, that in all the variation may or may not be pertinent to a scribe's handwriting. A follow-up question most relevant to um, these copies of the Testament of uh, Kahat and Amram is can we, and if so, how can we distinguish between the variation in a single scribe's hand in one manuscript and variation in his handwriting over several different uh, manuscripts that he has written? The Kahat and Amram copies are prone examples of manuscripts in which a lot of variation can um, be observed, both in terms of the arrangement of the manuscripts and in the execution of letter forms. I will first bring up two uh, case studies about variation, um, one of which is uh, 4Q550 that Albert already mentioned, and the other is uh, an assessment of the copies of the Aramaic Levi document. Um, why were they considered separate in their editions and on basis of what argument were they uh, again argued to be belong to one manuscript. Then I will briefly consider uh, a kind of distinction between what I call formal and informal manuscripts and then we'll delve into the uh, paleographic and manuscript evidence of um, the copies of the testament of Kahat and Amram while reflecting on the question whether the distinction between fragments one and two of the visions of uh, Amram and uh, the other fragments can be uh, made. These are the fragments of uh, 4Q550. And um, there have been several proposals to split these documents in two to six uh, copies. Um, and arguments that were used involved variation in more general features, such as the thickness of stroke and the use or non-use of particular um, means of ornamentation, but also differences in the size of the letters uh, and, and the way of writing of individual 
um, letters. As the many different proposals show, it is not easy to uh, agree on a, a particular distinction. Puesh, in the official edition of 2009, considers uh, most of the fragments to be one manuscript, and he made explicit that the preservation of the manuscript or the quality when it was written um, may have caused a different appearance of the letters and that it may look different, but that the traces of the letters are the same. If the ductus is the same, other factors may come into play to explain the variation. And Puesh mentions as one of the possibilities, the use of a different pen. Puesh pointed mostly at the similarity in uh, ductus and the traces of the letters and how they have been drawn. And in a forthcoming article in Dead Sea Discoveries, I try to do uh, a similar assessment, but then of the fragments of the Aramaic Levite document. The official edition distinguished six manuscript, but acknowledged in the meantime that the handwriting between three of those copies uh, was quite similar. I argue that what have been considered four manuscripts, four copies of the Levite text should be considered one manuscript written by the same scribe. At this uh, slide, you can see the large uh, variation in the, the appearance of the script. And in this manuscript, uh, even two of the, of the letters appear to be written in a different ductus. So not only the execution of the, the uh, letter is different, also the way the letter is written uh, differs. However, these variations do not occurs in specific and different um, uh, fragments, but also within the fragments. Even though variations in the writing of, for example, a tet may appear more often, um, let's say in fragment one than in fragment four, the fact that they appear in both uh, fragments uh, suffices to show that um, they're part of one manuscript. I included reflections on the nature of uh, manuscripts more generally and distinguished between formal and informal manuscripts based on the assessments of uh, the regularity of spacing between letters, words, lines, and the uses of ink. The regularity in letter size and the way the letters are drawn are also part of the uh, assessments. To be clear, I do not relate this to a particular writing style. I think we um, discussed that a little bit yesterday. Um, a form, I do not intend to say that a formal manuscript necessarily has only um, letters written in a formal uh, style, but I uh, consider an informal manuscript, a manuscript in which uh, letters can be written in any letter style, but are lacking in, in neatness, in regularity, consistency, careful, uh, organization, etc. If we compare, for example, the Testament of Kaat uh, at the right of the slide and the war scroll, uh, we see kind of extremes of a spectrum of um, um, neatness or regularity. While in the war scroll, the slant of the letters and the lines is the same. The distances between the letters and the words are clearly uh, consistent as are the distances between the lines. When we see, for example, uh, marked in red, the um, distance between lines five and seven is smaller than in the other text, in the other lines, this pattern repeats itself over several uh, columns of the same sheet. On the other hand, the Testament of Kaat is in many respects its opposite. The slant of the letters and the stance of the line differs um, the ink is not evenly spread, and it is clearly visible at what points the scribe kind of inked his pen again and started continued to write. The distance between the letters varies to a large extent, and some words uh, indicated by the circles uh, are written together. There's no space um, between the two words. Well, uh, 1QM also has some additions 
they're usually added neatly at the top of a line, whereas in uh, the Testament of God, words are expunctuated. They're written over other letters are written over other letters. Uh, they have been added between the line or even wiped out without, um, which is still visible on the on the manuscript. I realized that um, a distinction between formal and informal manuscripts may be somewhat artificial in a discussion about writer identification alone. The implication may be uh, that one scribe would have written and arranged manuscripts in either an informal or a formal um, manuscript and kind of implicitly linked to his skill. And um, I want to explicate that, of course, skill is not the only reason to explain variations. And um, we talked about it like a, a different a personal copy um, or, or writing with a or for writing faster um, also influences the appearance of a script and thus a scribe may have written both formal and informal manuscripts. Yet here in this presentation it functions for me as an observation that the lack of an attention and the layout uh, of a document may be mirrored in a large degree of variation in the execution of the letter forms in which case different features can still be attributed to one scribe. Also, in a discussion of writer identification uh, connected to assessing the amount of copies of the text, it has um, added value. Before I delve into the manuscript evidence of the Testament of Kahat and the visions of Amram, I want to sum up the arguments based on which a large vari variation could still be argued to be part of one scribal hand. First, even with a lot of variation in and among fragments, if the ductus of a letter is similar, it is highly probable that the fragments may still be written by one scribe, particularly in an informal manuscript. Second, there is evidence that scribes write a letter in a different ductus within one manuscript. Thus, a different doctors in itself is not sufficient to argue for a different scribe, as long as these variations appear um, within fragments, not only among different fragments. Third, considering the degree of variation in the layout and physical structure of the manuscript may give an indication of expected variation in the handwriting as well. A discussion of these two manuscripts involved the question whether um, one scribe has written uh, both of these texts, whether one scribe has written these texts in one manuscript, or whether we have two manuscripts um, with one or more scribes. The Testament of Kahan 4Q542 has been preserved in three different fragments, um, whereas we have here 10, but Puesha, the, the official edition has com, um, combined two of these fragments. Um, so I will refer to nine fragments in this, uh, on this, the di discussing this copy of the visions of Amram. In this slide, you can see the different fragments of these two um, manuscripts. And I have already indicated the irregularities in uh, the Testament of Kahat, but we may have even more variation in the vision of Amram. Fragment two at the left, the ink appears to be faded. The line spacing varies. The size of the letters is different. Uh, similarly in line fragment six, the ink traces are very different. <clears throat> the lines, are, the letters are small and varying and the size of the letters varies, which you can see very well in the um, alephs that I have marked um, on, the, on the subsequent lines. Fragment three shows the same pattern, whereas the fragment to the right, fragment nine, um, gives a more regular appearance than the other fragments in terms of the use of ink and the size of letter and the spacing between the words and the lines. Despite all this variation, 
it has been suggested that uh, these fragments all have been written by one scribe. Who has uh, suggested that these fragments were indeed written by one scribe, but that it are two different uh, manuscripts, possibly a distance of some years uh, for, the, for the scribe. And Makila took up his proposal, um, but argued that these two, what have now been called two manuscripts, he argued that it is, uh, belongs both to one manuscript, pointing at a similar lax level of care and the traces of interaction with the manuscript later are considered similar in both um, manuscripts. Makila focused on the following similarities in the letters, although I tried in all these examples uh, that will follow to uh, show on the one hand the variation uh, in the different uh, uh, fragments, um, but on the other hand, be clear enough about the similarities between the letters that uh, Puesh and Makila noticed. So the top of the Dalet has, uh, is, is square and that is in almost all cases. So even though the, the width of the letters um, may differ, um, Makila adds the curvature of the Chet, which is similar in both um, manuscript. Um, Puresh distinguishes in this case between an, uh, two Chets, one that is more H-shaped um, and one that is more N-shaped as he describes it. Um, and he seems to connect it with the different ductus, either in two or in three strokes. And again, the there are not too many summers, but uh, the formation of them is similar and both uh, are opened. And Makila pointed at a disjoint middle stroke of the shin, um, which is indeed preserved in both manuscripts, but the um, uh, we have to know that there are also uh, shins in both manuscripts in which the, the middle stroke is attached to the left stroke. Makila also um, adopted a Puesh's suggestion about Abdakov and the Lamed. And um, while we see the variation within the letters, they appear to be written similarly. It seems to me to be the case that the variation, variety in 4Q547 is larger uh, with differences in having a tick at the bottom or not. Whereas the tick at the bottom is there in all uh, cases of um, 4Q542. Um, but these are relatively similar. And with regard to the Lamed, um, I'd have to say that these look uh, very similar in most of the um, cases, but the, I hope you can see it on the pictures, but there's a clear difference between the manuscripts in the Testament of Kahat, in the Visions of Amram, so 4Q547, there is a tick in, um, written in kind of the same amount of, of ink, whereas in 4Q542, there is a clear distinction between the lamed as the kind of um, basic form and the tick at the top, which in almost all cases appears to be added with later, um, in which the clearly an addition of ink can be seen, except in cases in which the um, lamed itself is um, written with, I mean, darker ink or after the scribe has just inked his pen. And one example, most at the left, uh, in which the Lamed is um, corrected. I also see differences uh, between the uh, letters, how the letters have been written, uh, mostly in the uh, Aleph, the He, and the Tav. Most of the Alephs in 4Q542 are written in three strokes and the right stroke of the Aleph almost in all cases uh, connects to the extreme of the diagonal stroke. There may be a few examples in the text that connect more to the middle of the Aleph, one of which is at the right. Um, um, that specific one is, is however a correction. 
which may lead to kind of a different way of writing or writing over another letter. The Alephs of 4Q547, however, almost all connect to the middle of the diagonal stroke. Apart from uh, the one at the, the right, um, which is part of fragment one and fragment two, uh, to which I will come back uh, in a moment. The, the writing of the hay uh, is varied uh, in, in 4Q542, but there are two kind of basic types. At the left is the most common form in which the right downstroke uh, is longer than the, um, the left downstroke and in which the horizontal stroke extends beyond um, the left uh, downstroke. Slightly different is the hay uh, at the right in which uh, the, the horizontal stroke is more of a curving stroke. While both of the haze of 4Q542 appear to appear in 4Q547 as well, the variation in, these, uh, in the writing of the hay seems to be larger. Uh, to such an extent, there are also uh, forms that approach the uh, uh, writing of the chet in both, both of these manuscripts. Then uh, the tav, the foot of the tav is um, almost always written in uh, quite an angular stroke. It's almost as if the downstroke ends at the kind of uh, bottom and then the um, small left stroke is added. Whereas in the examples of 4Q547, it's a kind of, it has a more curving transition starting a little bit higher. While reviewing the paleographic evidence for these fragments, the appearance of 4Q547 fragment two struck me as particularly similar to um, the manuscripts of 4Q542. And then I read back Puesh's remarks on the paleographic descriptions of these. And then he stated in both cases that uh, the similarities are most outspoken in fragments one and two. Um, so that brought for me up the question whether these two fragments could be part of 542 um, and somewhat separate from the other fragments of 547. Here we have one picture of the what then would in that what in that case would be um, a single manuscript, and when we compare that to the um, fragment nine, for example, we see that it is it seems to be more fragment nine seems to be more regular uh, compared to four Q five four two. One of these, uh, these elements is the inking, the clear um, view of where the scribe inked his pen, uh, which is not visible in, in most of the other fragments of uh, 4Q547, but is, can be seen in fragments two of 547. And if we come back to the letters uh, that I have shown, we see that the Aleph of fragment uh, two in 547 are connected to the diagonal stroke in um, uh, at, at, at the extreme, whereas in the other fragments, it is at the middle. The curving horizontal stroke um, is, is seen in 542 and in fragments one and two, whereas different forms of hay are used in 547. The tick of the lamet may also be added um, in fragment two of uh, 547 whereas it seems to be kind of one movement in uh, the other fragments of 547. And the same goes for the angular foot of um, the tav, although there one of uh, one angular footed tav is also preserved in 547, the other manuscripts. Some final remarks about non-paleographic evidence. The reasons why these two manuscripts have, or yeah, these two groups of manuscripts have been argued to be 
uh, one manuscript are also based on um, content features on a similar column height, uh, which could be reconstructed based on an overlap of this copy with other copies of the visions of Amram. But this is particularly due to fragments one and two. Um, as it is based on this overlap and the reconstruction thereof, um, the alleged similarity in the margins on the upper and lower margins is also based on the uh, assessment of fragments one and two. I come to my conclusion. I have considered the assessment of paleographic variation within one document and within the handwriting of a single scribe. We looked at two different examples of uh, variation in, within a scribal hand by looking at uh, 4Q550 and uh, copies of the Levi document. In both cases, the preservation of material and the irregularity among and within fragments allows to argue for the same scribe. In the case study of the variation in 542 and 547, the question has to be split into two, the question of a similar scribe versus the question of a similar scribe in one single manuscript. I have argued that 4Q547 fragments one and two appear to be significantly different from the other fragments of 547. Although the amount of preserved material does not allow any firm conclusions, it is important to realize that the overlaps with other copies of the visions of Amram may have influenced the purely paleographic judgment. The inclusion of fragments one and two in a different uh, manuscript may have, governed, may have been governed by uh, additional and textual concerns. By means of this case study, I've attempted to reflect on possibilities for a meaningful interpretation of variation carefully assessing hints at pertinent features of a scribe on basis of small material, small amounts of material, while still acknowledging the possibility of large amounts of variation in the handwriting of one scribe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hanneke. Fascinating paper laid out very clearly. Thank you. Uh, looking at the time, we do have room for one question. Uh, Gemma. Please. Hi, Hanika. Thank you very much Hi. for your paper. It was really great um, to, to go through with such detail uh, all of the letters. I guess I'm just interested because in some ways you and I are coming to slightly different conclusions in the manuscripts that we are looking at. Um, in that I have started to think that there's uh, less uh, variability in the handwriting of a scribe and you're starting to think that there's more, but then I'm kind of thinking more about Ibert's paper and this idea of like elementary hands and skilled and maybe to a point we're dealing with uh, two different scribes in that I'm dealing with a um, quite a skilled scribe, whereas maybe you're dealing with more of an elementary scribe. But I'm just wondering maybe if you can comment on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this question. It is indeed, um, there, there have been a suggestions that, because we see a lot of corrections in, in particularly the Testament of Kahat, which is a kind of larger uh, subsequent uh, lines that, that we can assess. And there are quite some corrections. Um, and it has been argued that um, these are of, of a kind of other person who later looked at the manuscript and, and corrected what the, whatever the scribe could not, uh, I don't know, get right. Um, it, is, it is difficult to I mean, to really distinguish between later corrections or corrections that the scribe may have made himself. I have, um, let me check. Here, for example, this is um, uh, kind of written above something else. And um, 
you would assume that if if a, that this could have been done by the scribe himself when he recognized that he uh, did make a mistake and just made an aleph of it uh, to make it fit to the um, to what he actually wanted to say. Um, so I'm not sure that the correction is indeed of a later person with the aim of correcting someone who was not able to, I mean, write very well or was more at an elementary level of writing. Um, but I find it hard to say that about the much smaller fragments of 4Q547. Um, yeah, so these are my reflections on that um, question. Thank you very much. Um, well, one final one, and then we'll go to the general discussion. Arian Bakker. Arian. Thank you, Annika, for a very uh, meticulous uh, study. Uh, I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about what we can learn from scribal variation. So from scribal variation of one particular scribe, why do some uh, manuscripts have more scribal variation than others? Does it say something about the status of the, of the, of the manuscript, about the usage of the text? Is there any link perhaps between literary variations and scribal variations or stability of a text? Um. Thank you. That is a helpful question. Um, I think uh, it is difficult to, to say th something kind of about this, the status of this text, uh, because the Testament of Kaat has been preserved only in one uh, manuscript, and it has even been argued that uh, the presence of a Levi text, the Amram text in several copies, that this uh, was written by someone just to um, kind of um, feel the the missing link between Levi and Amram. Mm -hmm. um, so it, yeah, then an, another uh, point is that it, uh, the assessment of these uh, features may lead to um, an assessment of the idea that it was written as a trilogy. Some people uh, use the argument of um, that these two manuscripts would have been written by two, by one uh, scribe, or even one manuscript, as a kind of proof for the fact that these, uh, at least the Kahat and Amram text circulated as a, um, uh, yeah, trilogy, or at least two uh, books together. Um, I suppose, one would need to, uh, regarding your uh, question of the stability of the text, it is difficult to um, think about it because we only have this text and also there is not a kind of larger traditions about Kahat in which we know more how the, the figure of Kahat was um, perceived in, in that time period. Thank you very much. Annika and also Arjen for your question. Um, I'm looking at the time. Uh, I would like to uh, go over to the general discussion and I have a, a number of names on my list with still also questions for, for Ibert. And I think that also takes it nicely to the general discussion. Uh, and I will call out your name and then uh, ask you to ask your question. I would like to start with Sarah Yardney. Please, Sarah. Yes, thank you. I needed to close my window quick to <laughs> get out the noise from outside. So thank you for waiting. So, um, Ibert, my question was whether you could say some more about your very last point. At the very end of your presentation, you said, you know, this impacts how we should interpret the library or collection um, based on the heterogeneity that we see. Can you say some more about that? How, how do you interpret the library or the collection based on the heterogeneity? What, what does it mean, do you think? Um, it's it's easier for me to say what it doesn't mean than what it means. So I'm I'm still keep having an open mind in this respect. I think what we all of us who, who look at many of these manuscripts, what we observe is that we have on the one hand a lot of manuscripts that display variations of the same style, and this is largely the style that Frank Milcross has described also for the Herodian. At the same time, we also see. Uh, all kinds of outliers. Now, does it mean that these texts came from somewhere else or that uh, 
if we think of Qumran as a community where people came, which is the majority opinion, did they come from other places with uh, different training, etc. We don't have, I think at the moment, we, we just don't have enough material from the context to pinpoint where specific types of writing come from. But uh, because of this large variety, I'm just really careful, cautious to just assign everything to one group at the same place. Thank you, Ibert. Uh, and then we go to Yuta Yokiranta. Oh, sorry, I wasn't expecting to be included. Thanks. It's just the short uh, question in the end of the four QS manuscripts you, you showed. Uh, uh, um, no, six QS and the other one. Whether, whether your comments were on those specifically or, or larger um, uh, suggestion about them being as, you know, writing exercises or training manuscripts. Thanks. Yeah, your question that, that you wrote down was, was actually, what do you think about these 4QS manuscripts? Were they just uh, for training or whatever? Uh, at least some of those, uh, yes. Uh, I also uh, refer, but that goes back a long time to Hartmut Stegemann, who, who already made the observation that the S manuscripts and the D manuscripts uh, were quite different in execution and in presentation. And he, but he also was talking from a specific model, of course, and I'm not necessarily adhering to a model, but for him, the D manuscripts were for promulgation to all kinds of machanot in the land of Israel or whatever he would call it, while the S manuscripts were for a local whatever thing. I, basically, Yuta, I know you and several others, you immediately want to fit something in a larger view of, of larger model. Uh, Ultimately, we also have to do it, but I'm just careful. So uh, what I see is that only one, perhaps two, uh, uh, of the D manuscripts, but the ones that are worst reserved also have this kind of, well, we're not allowed to use the word informal anymore, not vulgar, et cetera, but a kind of uh, different non-nicely written, uh, and, and so with D, that is the exception, and with S, is almost the rule. Let's put it like that. And, uh, and my fun. thought that they were just using it in, in, in education, of course, that is just a hypothesis for fun, but it may be true. Okay, that's, that's great. I, I would want to continue the fun part. Uh, Hindi Naiman. Fun is my middle name. <laughs> um, Right, so I hear that you're saying it just for fun, but it's absolutely not just for fun, Ibert. It's a very serious claim that you're talking about um, these texts as a context for study. So one is I just, I responded to some of the questions um, partly because we had, we've discussed this before, but you are certainly committed to a much more variegated way of thinking about community. You're interested in liturgical performance. You're interested in these deluxe, deluxe um, editions for a kind of teaching. You're also interested in, study practices or schooling practices. Um, and I think you do have a very big picture about the way in which scribal culture and scribal pedagogy is operating based on the work um, that you've done on scribal hands. So my, my, my question first is just a clarification to respond to a lot, of, a lot of comments that said, oh, so would you reduce it back to a school and go back to this position? And I think your answer is absolutely not. So I wanted you to offer some clarification on that because you're not interested in reducing the scrolls or um, the community or communities behind the scrolls to one way of thinking, but also to ask you to reflect and integrate your, your presentation and perhaps here Hanukkah and Ihan can jump in as well. Um, um, into, I think one way of asking this question, and I put it to you directly and implicitly to Hanukkah and to Ihan, what difference you know, does it make if you identify um, a, a vulgar or an untrained scribe or a sloppy scribe 
or a single scribe with a very refined hand. This is really, I think, what everyone was asking when they said, so are you talking about a school, right? What difference does it make for the way you're reading these texts and the way you're thinking about them? Because I do think that there is a very big picture underlying the way you're talking about scribal practices, obviously all in their particular iterations and expressions, um, but always with an eye to larger implications for re reading and meaning. I, I could say more, but I'll, I'll stop there so you can reflect and maybe the others want to reflect. Thank you. I think what we all do, uh, I'm looking at um, Logan and uh, Hanukkah and Ihan, is that we, we, we want to go to and fro from uh, back and forth from looking at details and trying to see patterns and from the patterns trying to move to the larger pictures and the models. Now, you're pushing a little bit too much at this moment, asking me to move from these details and small studies on just 10, 15 manuscripts I've been looking at and uh, we could add perhaps 10 more and then a large story. So yes, I would say these manuscripts, at least some of them are evidence of, could be seen as evidence of apprenticeship. They certainly can be seen as a large degree of difference of training of people. And that makes it interesting. That is the question. Why do people who have not been trained as scribes nonetheless write these texts? And that is why I refer to at one but last slide to all the different things we have been looking at. And I'm not going, uh, even when Yuta asked this question, I was already going a little bit too far. And uh, I think, Hindi, what we need to do is just resist uh, models and trying to fit in uh, new ideas. We can do that if we talk together, but I'm not going to do it in this audience of 60 or 70 people. And uh, Okay, wonderful. You're right, no school, but I would, I would try to avoid the word school and use apprenticeship in, and several people wrote about it in a general term, how, however we see that. Uh, Anneke, Ihan, would you like uh, to chip in? Well, regarding the, um, I, I only can speak about a Testament of God, so it's, it's somewhat uh, limited. Um, but I would say that this may, um, it shows a kind of involvement with other traditions and it knows, uh, it, it engages with ideas about the uh, priest and maybe uh, even a kind of, yeah, a scribal function of, of a priest and, and engaging with similar themes as are preserved, especially in the um, Aramaic Levi document, but also uh, other um, ideas that come to us from the text of Qumran. Um, so I would, yeah, it is someone that is, I would say it's someone that is familiar with uh, several traditions, but in terms of kind of apprenticeship of scribes, I, I it would be difficult for me to argue that, that the Testament of Coward is in that sense a kind of elementary um, manuscript. Thank you. I hope. Uh, okay, I won't push it too far, but potentially those implications can be really interesting, right? Just uh, as Hanukkah demonstrates or talks that different compositions could be written or different texts could be written by the same uh, scribe. That is really exciting, both on the level of one manuscript, but also about thinking about how these scribe, because we don't know a lot about um, these groups behind the scrolls, apart from kind of this material evidence. Uh, this brief point I tried to make in my presentation that we don't have book lists, uh, uh, you know, classifications of text. We don't have that, of those things. There's, so we don't really know how to reconstruct kind of uh, which texts were written by which group. So the moment we find something, read on a pistol we have, or rather, uh, 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 or for example, uh, identify the same hand on multiple manuscripts. That is a first start to think about these things, right? About circulation of texts, of manuscripts, compositions, 
sometimes over several generations. So yeah, I do, there's a lot in there, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, George Brook. George, please come on in. Uh, uh, thank you all three for a wonderful session. Um, I, I think uh, I would want to complicate things a little bit further by saying that even expert scribes probably deserve to be trained further. Uh, and uh, that we have some specialist products in the caves, which are really challenging and intriguing. Um, for example, the cryptic script uh, materials, uh, but also the um, tufilin, which are written in micrography and must need some kind of special care and attention. Uh, I would include also the writing of certain esoteric or magical texts, word squares. Um, and you can see that in fact, um, the what Nave called uh, a writing exercise, a uh, list of proper names could well have some kind of um, training aspect to it, but be about uh, magic and the list of angels names and so on. So uh, I think we can take what you're doing extremely seriously, but actually uh, provide it with multiple layers. Um, but thank you uh, all very much indeed. Thank you very much, George. It's fascinating to take it indeed further and complicate it more. And I would like to give the floor to Peter Porzig. Peter, please come on in. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a question uh, for, yeah, actually, which, which kind of brings it into the, the focus of the conference. Um, we all know there are, there are um, bribes and, and scribblers <laughs> who can, can uh, decide. All of us know what it, an, an, an elementary, what you called an elementary uh, a script would, would look like or manuscript would look, look like. Um, but I would ask for um, more like objective, um, uh, obje objective uh, uh, um, data um, to be used for that. I mean, you have this great uh, computer project, for example, the, the variation in between uh, uh, writing a certain letter, an olive, like this, like this, um, sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller. We have, um, yeah, the, the variation in um, width of the strokes, uh, or whatever you call it, um, um, with re-inking all the time. These, these are all things where you can measure um, a kind of uh, a variation where we can say, okay, if there's very much variation, how much do they adhere to the to the dry lines? Are there dry lines at all? And so on um, to make, um, I don't know, to calculate a, um, one, one value or whatever, um, and, and to have a kind of criterion um, to say this is, more elementary. This is more skilled, obviously. Uh, also, the, the the strokes, if they are very linear or if they are elaborate and curved and and, and not doing done nicely. Um, so, to, so to, uh, I mean, you would imagine that this would be kind of a continuum uh, uh, from unskilled or whatever to skilled. But maybe there are uh, groups detectable uh, or certain steps where we could say, okay, these, these group of texts seem to be written more or less by experts usually, and this more or less by a not trained, not so well trained or not yet so well trained uh, uh, scribes. Um, so I'm just asking if would that not be perfect uh, 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 use for the computer? Yeah. Uh, maybe I would you first would like to take it on the say the paleographic side and I take it on the computer side. Uh, the short answer is to a large extent yes. 
with their own bugs, etc. But yes, uh, and uh, at some point, and we, we've seen several different approaches to using computers, whether allographic or, or other ways, and this mother will deal with that. And I, I think certainly we could go do much, much more than we do now. This is the short answer. Mladen. And maybe to chip in very briefly, um, first from, from the non-computer side, uh, a recent article by Drew Longacre, uh, distinguishing between, say, rectilinear and curvilinear mm -hmm. is, uh, is, is a direction uh, one could take. Um, now, in our own article that will be published shortly, uh, you see, and it is very important to carefully distinguish between the different steps that we take. The first step is, as Ibert is also indicating, and as I explained on Tuesday, we... Um, quantify on different levels of the handwriting, both allographic and textual. And that then shows a cluster uh, or clusters. And then there was the statistical testing. And only then, if the clustering is statistically significant, and we say that also in our article, only then is it allowed to also try and go and look for visualization. And um, that is possible to then work on an aggregate level. And it was a comment yesterday made by, by Judith uh, Schlanger in her presentation, um, you know, discussing pertinent features, both on script, which is the, the, the trained part, the cultural part, the mimetic, we would call it, yeah. and on the, um, on, the, on the individuality of a scribe, the pertinent features, which we would call the genetic, the biomechanical uh, traits. And, and she then uh, explained how, how uh, Daniel, Daniel Stuckel showed, you know, with a computer, you could cut out uh, all kinds of alephs for a page. Mm -hmm. uh, but she said, for the paleographer, it's not so useful because you have to go through all of those several hundreds and so on and so forth. Now, what we did uh, on the third uh, uh, level of analysis is what we call with these heat maps, that if mm -hmm. you have a cluster, when it's statistically significant, uh, you could then uh, produce also these heat maps and you could see what are on this one heat map, very slight differences, but they're the aggregate level of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of instances of a letter. And then they're much more significant than if you would just take one particular Aleph and another one and then see slight differences, which is how we usually use charts and maps. Mm -hmm. So yep. it is possible because you can then also, as we've shown, calculate differences between scribes. Mm -hmm. Now, if you then take it to an evaluation of it's elementary or not, uh, that is also, as Ibert said, there is a, a matter of subjectivity in there or a matter of fluidity of mm -hmm. the terms that we use to, to uh, norm it. I totally agree. I mean, there there certainly is this this kind of kind of continuum, but uh, who knows? I mean, if we, if we let it run through all the manuscript we have, who knows if there might be some 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 grouping that that was the only thing I was I was suggesting and, and it may help out of this uh, situation where we have to say uh, for the deep learning for example we have to or for real scribable uh, to 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 find out the the, the single scribe uh, we need more uh, more more data more more evidence so to speak this is something that you could avoid here because you would only look at one manuscript or one fragment uh, and, and, and would not have um, to make predictions for uh, uh, other stuff. So it, it might be easier than to identify the scribe. Yeah, yeah, well, we are working on it, Peter. We hope to show yeah. more in the future on that, but yeah. Great, great. Yeah. Great. Thank yeah. you. And um, then I'm looking at the time. I would like to give the final question to Carolina Toche, because I think also for Ibert. Carolina? Yes, excuse me, I had to find the uh, mic on button. <laughs> uh, Ibert, thank you very much for your um, illuminating talk. I think it showed once again the importance of um, clear definitions and careful observations. And um, my question draws a little on the craftsmanship, um, especially in the, um, you called it the unskilled hands. And I wonder if you encountered um, varying angles of inception, especially in, in the unskilled hands, um, in a trained and skilled 
writer, you would uh, expect very constant uh, angles of inception. And um, I think um, the different um, traces of uh, different inking could be uh, also um, a hint on varying angles of inception. Yeah. Thank you, Carolina. I read your, your question half an hour or an hour ago, and I started <laughs> thinking about it immediately. I, I, actually, I would like to hear from uh, Judith, for example, or other ones, what exactly we, we when we're talking about square Hebrew, uh, which is different from the text you're working with, I think, uh, how it works. What I do think is, uh, yes, I think a great, I was started looking at all the things that you were talking about, and there are a few of those that, that clearly are um, inconsistent in their, what you call angles of inception. And as a side remark, this is one of the giveaways of many of those so-called forged uh, fragments that have turned up and about uh, which Orstein and Mikael Langlois have written. There you see it so clearly, they are, you just see by the angles that this is wrong. Um, but <laughs> these elementary texts on the whole, it is okay. I saw Judith popping up. Judith, could you just, uh, if it's okay with the chair at least? Uh... Yes, of course. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I think it would be too long to talk about square, non-square, cursive and so on and so forth in, uh, in, in medieval Hebrew. I cannot talk about Qumran Hebrew. But square, it's not necessarily about being square as shape. Square is a typological typological value, and uh, square and non-square is the basic distinction. And this is a distinction which, I, as I said yesterday, it's, it's, it, it is a formal distinction. That means it is based on specific shapes of the letters. The non-square appears for the first time in, well, for the Middle Ages, as you know, we have such a diversity of scripts and such a possibility of comparison that maybe what you consider as different types for us will be the same, because otherwise you would end up with uh, hundreds of types. So square is a type and non-square is another. And to make a distinction between them, it's not just the fact that the lines would meet at straight angles or that they are going to be curvy linear. But the question is that there are very clear allographs, very clear forms of letters, which are really different, not only from morphological point of view, but also from the point of view of the ductus. So the most important element, the middle of the 10th century AD, it's the introduction of the kappa-shaped aleph for non-square scripts. From that time onwards, in Iraq, we can talk about the development of non-square scripts. Before that, we have different qualities, different styles of the same mode, which is square mode of script. Right? I don't know that it, whether it is useful, this medieval comparison, but this is how we define it in the Middle Ages. Otherwise, we would end up with too many modes. Thank Thank you very much, Judith, for the explanation. Um, and I can imagine, I already see Ivert. <laughs> we can continue this. And I would suggest, uh, as we did a while ago at, the, at the, the meeting we had in Oxford in March, uh, that people who want to, they can continue. Uh, but uh, we do take a break. So those who uh, have to take a break and take a break um, and can continue the discussion, of course. But I do want to thank Hanneke. Ihan and Ibert for their excellent uh, presentations. Very stimulating, great discussion. Everyone also participating in the discussion. Thank you very much for your comments and questions. And we start, we start again at 3.45 sharp. See you later.